As human beings, we're constantly striving to kind of order the world. That's, that's our most fundamental process in this constant uh, interaction of saying, how do we make sense? How do we make sense? How do we make sense? And, and we're always putting pieces together. And the most effective and efficient way of putting pieces together is through storytelling. There was one really crucial turning point for me, and I was about 14 or 15, and I was up late at night watching television, and I happened to kind of uh, switch a channel, and there was a silent film showing, and I was utterly transported into this other world, and something spoke to me about a form, about a way of telling a story, about something I had never seen before, even though I'd seen movies. Cinema was invented by uh, montage, by editing, because without that, and that was the basic fundamental way of understanding how to organize both narrative flow, how to organize information, how to organize aesthetic experience. This was the spinal cord of the new art form. There is this film, uh, it was a great American classic, it's called The Great Train Robbery by Edwin S. Porter. It, it certainly uh, played with a number of things that became essential to uh, how you tell stories using film. This film was the first time American audiences were seeing uh, things like tracking shots, panning shots, double exposure. But to look at that now today and you say, my God, this is primitive and it's laughable. And yet, it was fundamental in terms of restructuring a form of storytelling. Digital shifted the terrain in ways that we're only beginning to understand. It certainly shifted the terrain in terms of audiences for a whole set of reasons, and having to do with control, having to do with saying, I can kind of try and control my experiences and decide how I want to structure my experiences. For example, we talked about montage as being central to the, to the whole way you can tell a story. The equivalent in uh, an interactive story is navigation, and, and navigation allows you to kind of move. It organizes aesthetic experience, it organizes information, it organizes an emotional experience by how you can kind of go from one thing to the next. So with the interactive world, uh, where you're incorporating choice as part of your storytelling, what you're doing is, let's take it at its simplest level, you're taking, uh, say, a mouse, and you're moving it in space. But what you're doing constantly is, is moving in this virtual space of going from one scene, say, to another scene, to another scene, or coming back to something uh, and revisiting it. A movie is a finite work. Uh, it, it begins, it ends, it's complete in and of itself. It's recreated every time uh, an audience sits and watches it. That's when that magic happens, but in and of itself, it's finished. An interactive work may never be finished. There is no uh, narrative without interaction. There is no way of kind of coming to a cinematic experience that moves you without you constantly interacting, constantly kind of engaged with it. Can this form of art actually be uh, a, a way of telling stories that engage emotionally, uh, intellectually, uh, artistically, aesthetically? And I think the, I think so. The impact and the power of it comes from the way audiences have seized hold of it. Innovation to me is something that emerges out of a, a deep necessity of finding a way of, of saying something that existing means don't allow you to. The exciting thing for me about all of this is, is that it is unknown. <laughs> that we can't kind of chart and say, here's where we're going to end up, that we can't kind of predetermine the end results. We're just at the beginning of an exploration of modes of engagement and storytelling that will lead us down some dead ends, but will lead us, I think, elsewhere to some kind of radically different ways of engaging with the world. And I think that's absolutely crucial. Please welcome Tom Permuter. Uh, thank you, thank you. Um, what, what, 
what I want to do now is, is, is give my impression, certainly as, as Michelle has said, of the uh, last few days that I've spent completely immersed in, in Sunny Lab uh, from morning to night, and also based obviously on my own experiences uh, of being deeply involved in digital transformation at a major institution, the National Film Board of Canada, and all the reflections and thinking and reading and engagement I've had with uh, creators, with projects, um, uh, around the world. And one thing, e even as I was talking there about this, this new art form, what clearly struck me is we're still in early days. We're experimenting. We're still playing with new modes of storytelling. We're in a transition period. It was interesting to me that many of the projects presented uh, over at Sunny Lab concluded with and we are going to make that documentary film and it'll be broadcast. As if the doc film was the capstone, it was the legitimization of the interactive work. So, so that umbilical cord to traditional is still deeply embedded there. It's hard to let go of that. And I, I also found that many of the projects, and I thought they were great, I thought they were so interesting in, in, in very varied kinds of ways, but many of them still conceived of transmedia in terms of the material to which you could give access to an audience, you know, and they can go there and they can look at photos or they can get these kind of music or they can get this extra material and they can have all of this. And yes, it'll, it's all linked into an overall experience, but it wasn't truly integrated. It wasn't conceived in some kind of, uh, in terms of the form itself. It still had something of that feeling that, uh, you know, and, and I spent years as a documentarian where you always looked at the cutting room floor and you looked at the piles of research you, you did and you thought, my God, I wish I could get this out there because there's so much good material. So there's still that impulse of saying, there's all this fabulous material and I'm gonna find a way of kind of giving it to the audiences. I mean, the projects are much more sophisticated now in, in their use of the material, but I think there is still uh, a ways to go to achieve what I'm more convinced than ever uh, today than even a few months ago, that transmedia interactive work is a radically new art form. Um, if we're not there yet, I, I, I don't lose heart because I think we're at the equivalent. We, I had this conversation with Michelle about when we talked about the equivalence with the invention of, uh, uh, of, of cinema and that, that time period between the invention of the technology um, of the movie camera and uh, film and so on in the mid-19th century and the, the actual birth of cinema, which didn't happen for about 20 years as, as people started to kind of begin to... Uh, uh, play with the notion of creating forms of creation. I refer to that because if you look at very early silent films like The Great Train Robbery, it, it does seem very laughable. And yet, audiences had to learn a whole new way of understanding storytelling. And I think we're somewhere in that kind of uh, process. What, what, what I'd like to do now is just, just look at some of the things that are going to keep driving change. And the first thing I want to talk about is audience. And I cannot overemphasize the importance of audience. I mean, this is, this is fundamental to uh, everything of where we are headed and fundamental in a different way than we normally think about audience. And I'll explain why in a minute. I mean, part of the reason is, is, is growth. Globally, the audience is continuing to grow. Yesterday, Ruby Chen of CNEX noted that in China alone, in the in a one-year period from December 2012 to 2013, there was an 80% increase of web and mobile uh, audiences. Uh, uh, you know, and when we're talking about 80% increase, we've gone into the hundreds of millions. Creators will go where the audiences are. Uh, learning, audiences are still in their early phases of learning as well uh, in, in, in this world of of uh, uh, interactivity in the world of, of the net, in the world of mobile and platform. Uh, think about apps for a moment. Consider apps. We all have them. There are literally thousands upon thousands of them available. We use them for all sorts of things. The map that gets us around, chatting, uh, you know, our, our personal social networks and so on. But there's one thing that all apps do 
and we do not give it any conscious thought whatsoever. They educate us. They are teaching us a different mode of engagement with these devices that contain our lives. We are constantly learning how to read information and input information and aggregate information and how to kind of tell stories in different kinds of ways through various forms. I mean, you know, those uh, uh, status updates that you put on uh, Facebook, for, it's a form of narrative. It's a form of telling little stories about yourself, for example. So we're in this massive, massive process without realizing it of learning something about a different way of kind of relating uh, not to technology, but to the world. And, and this is a massive sea change to, to what is becoming the Internet of Things. Uh, wearable technology will add to that shifting relationship of audiences. And I, I can't see a future where we are going to segregate from the vast set of our other ways of experiencing and living in the world with our devices and which influence every aspect of our lives, you know, financial, health, education, relationships, uh, uh, everything. And we're going to have a whole very complex set of relationships to, to these sorts of things through our interactions, through the applications, through all sorts of different sites and so on. And, 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 and these are experiences which are complex, they're layered, they're interactive. And we're going to go from that, which dominate our lives, and say, are we now going to be satisfied to move to a more limited set of experiences when we come to that which we call entertainment? So the, the, this is part of what is a deep, I, th I see, undergoing uh, sea change that is happening. And it's, it's not simply about a sea change in our industry, about media. It's something even more profound, and it's a theme I'm going to reiterate and come back to because it, it takes on various forms and, and it's a change about how we perceive and understand the world. It's a change about how we know things. Connected, this is a truism about audiences as well, that audiences are connected in many different ways to many different people. You know, it's one, one to one, many to one, one to many, one to groups, groups to one. But what's interesting it, that goes beyond the notion of connection is the idea that what we're actually also doing is are forming neural networks. We're forming neural networks that are connecting brains and sensations and, 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 and again, ways of interacting with the world. And what it's doing, again, is part of this shift in terms of a perceptual shift, a shift in terms of how we begin to uh, see and understand the world. And, I, again, it's that deep, deep change that's going on that I think is going to be very fundamental in terms of where we go into the future and will impact in terms of where this particular art form will head into the future as well. I, I, I also, before I leave audience, I just want to focus for a minute on the word audience because it obscures a very important difference from traditional media. Um, you know, we understand audience particularly in a broadcast kind of way. We are sending out a show or something to that audience and we measure the ratings and, and we kind of, and, and we do that to some extent in, in the interactive world by saying, well, we, we now can measure uh, even better, you know, the number of people, the clicks and, and how long they're staying. But we're missing out on something when we use the word audience because the audience is, is not a homogenous concept, and by that I don't mean here diversity, I'm not talking about that diversity that refers to ethnicity, gender, race, age, and class. I'm talking about a very different idea of audience, because audience, by definition, is a, is a, it's about an act of receiving. I'm an, uh, as an audience member, I'm there to receive. Etymologically, audience is about hearing, you know. Uh, something, as a producer, I am giving something to the audience to consume. Um, it's a catch-all term. Um, in the interactive world, we are not simply the givers and the so-called audience, the receivers. Audience in our traditional understanding of the term is really this broadcast under, is, is only a subset of something much more extensive because our audience now may be at any time co-creator, citizen, activist, teacher, learner, collaborator, fan, and so on. 
And we need to understand audience much more thoroughly in a very different way. I will note that in all the sessions I sat in, audience received the occasional lip service, but very little serious attention. Everyone knew to say, well, we'll connect with them on social networks, we're doing this, we're setting up our Facebook page, and so on, uh, or we're connecting through interest groups, and it stopped there. Uh, and this is typical of the doc world, in a way. When I used to talk about the importance of understanding and relating to audiences, to documentary filmmakers, I tended to get an almost offended reaction. It was like, oh God, I'm making my film. I'm not going to be dictated to by what an audience wants. After all, this is art, not paint by numbers. Well, it's an attitude that uh, misunderstands profoundly what audience means and what a relationship and what understanding audience means and how much more crucial that is when we are talking about interactivity, when the audience becomes our collaborators in our processes. The, the exception I must note in, in the sessions was John Farron this morning in the session on pioneers where in what he called himself, in, and I quote his brutal Anglo-Saxon way, uh, said audience was everything and, and proceeded to attack uh, uh, the French mode of uh, valuing, above all, the auteur. So it was about to, I think, break out into a fist fight, but uh, Michel stepped in. No, I'm exaggerating. Uh, but there was an interesting debate to be had there. I, I, do, I actually think that this dichotomy between auteur and audience is a false one, and that the new auteurs will understand that the relationship to audience as co-creators and collaborators is part of their medium of creation, not simply the aftermath of their creation. So there's massive amounts of work to be done and which will be done to change our understanding of interactivity in terms of uh, audience. And it's much more than about numbers. I think we don't understand anywhere near enough in terms of the cognitive processes of what's going on in terms of interactivity. I don't think we understand deeply enough. I, we, we do segmentation, we can give you demographics and so on. I don't think that, that we've gone really far enough into that kind of how people use it uh, and what kinds of ways and what situations, relationships to education, age, social class, and so on. And there are all sorts of ways in which I think I wouldn't even be able to define today in which our research will open into audiences, will open up new understandings that we can't predict at the moment, which will be even more interesting and more revealing and have greater impact on the work we will do in the future. Um, there are other, there's some key differenti differentiators uh, in interactive work from traditional doc where uh, the interactive can do things that the classical documentary form cannot. And we're beginning to see some of these very clearly already. And, and they were evident in quite a few of the presentations that I saw over the last few days, even if only in embryonic form. One which has often been talked about is immersiveness. Uh, there's a totality of experience which is of a different order from linear docs. I, I can become completely, and I have been many times, swept away and lost in a traditional, in a classic documentary. They have great power. They will continue to have great power. And I want to underline that nothing that I say here is about dislocation or replacement or undermining of classic documentary forms. I'm talking about just something new. In, in the same way that cinema was new but did not eradicate theater or television in the 50s was new, but it did not eliminate the movies. The quality of immersion in an interactive work is simply greater by virtue of the fact that I, as an audience, or co-creator, collaborator, am placed right in the heart of the project. Uh, and that intensity of that experience can be kind of modulated, it can become much more so, less so, but it's central to that relationship. Uh, and we had a great example of this, it was spoken a couple of times over the uh, last couple of days, including this morning by um, the director, Philip Cox, about uh, an interactive project related to his feature documentary, but completely standalone, called Love Hotel, which was done with uh, uh, Upian and, and Ban Piosh. 
Uh, and a terrific example of creating intimacy, uh, a different kind of experience, which, which is only allowing a couple in it, as it were, at a time, although it can be any number of couples happening, but it feels completely devised for that couple alone, in that moment, in that experience, in a way uh, that uh, the, the traditional, the, the feature doc that Philip did would never even attempt, could never do. Um, so so, so that, that's kind of interesting. Again, immersiveness is important both for itself but also for something else. Um, it shifts the mental map in ways that linear can't do. Uh, you know, I can watch, and I'm going to give a very banal example, a hundred films about driving. I may have amassed a vast amount of theory about the nature of driving. I may even, through very well-constructed stories, narratives, developed an emotional relationship to driving, and, and road movies, for example, are classic examples of, of that kind of emotional relationship to driving. But until I have my hands on the wheel, I'll be missing something, that fundamental experience that changes everything. So I mentioned earlier about learning and this perceptual shift, this, this shift. So, Again, this is another example. This is another facet of this learning experience which is changing how we are constructing the world, how we are seeing. And I, I call this uh, an epistemological shift. That, that means just uh, how we know the things, how, how, how we know to know things. And our knowing is always embedded within a particular construct, conceptual universe that we swim in without being aware of. They're the boundaries that define how we know things. And I think what the digital world is doing is shifting those boundary markers of how we know things. And, and, and it's there that art will come to play a very crucial role. And I'll come back to that again. Big data, enormous um, you know, competitor, as it were, advantage here for the interactive documentary because it can build in accumulation of massive amounts of information and, and make sense of it in real time. And, and we saw this in quite a number of projects presented over the last few days. The most uh, advanced in that respect was uh, the project Génération Quoi, which was built on a, a, a survey uh, questionnaire, 143 questions, filled in by 230,000 French youth and was integrated into this whole uh, kind of massive uh, work, um, interactive work, uh, which changed the understanding of a generation in a way that a purely academic sociolo sociological study could never have done. And, and so really impressive of what happens when you can suddenly kind of gobble up big data and begin to use it as a creative uh, tool in, in, in your tool set in terms of creating and thinking differently about the world. Shadows was another project which wants to gather the world's dreams into a massive database. And again, relying on the notion that we can acquire data and we can manipulate it and we can kind of draw pictures that would otherwise been un unable to get at and, and provide remarkably different views of the world. Uh, connected Walls is another project, talked about using quizzes to create modes of interactivity. Uh, immigrant Nation out of the States aspires to become a database. Uh, Generation 14, an interactive project about the First World War, is relying on access to a database of 1.4 million files from the Ministry of Defense to connect their audiences to their own personal stories through a kind of genealogical search. Again, impossible in a classic documentary form. Uh, Mandy Rose spoke about a project in the UK called Risk Taker Survival Guard, where the audience data input will change the result of the film. So uh, again, interesting shifts, interesting ways in which data uh, comes to play a creative role but at the same time, what, again, I'll go back to my theme, what that, that means is that it's also changing our, our, our understanding of the world. It's, again, part of another brick in that perceptual shift, another kind of uh, ways in which, which things are changing the way we kind of connect. Participatory, this is inherent and interactive and difficult in a linear doc. 
many of the projects presented had central to them participatory actions, and was certainly essential for uh, activist projects like Action Switchboard, which wants to uh, effect real ongoing social transformation in very specific kinds of ways. Everyday Rebellion was another activist one which depended very much so on that participatory uh, relationship with its audiences. I put those to one side, uh, because they're brilliant, they're, they're actually really brilliant projects, uh, and although they may use documentaries in the documentary form, the sites themselves are activist sites. They're not attempts at redefining the art form. They're not attempts at trying to create an understanding of what the future of the interactive documentary is in and of itself. A project which I found impressive in adapting low-tech for a participatory doc is Quipu, which is about uh, a, a story in, in Latin America about forced sterilization uh, among, you know, uh, uh, groups, uh, uh, underprivileged groups of women uh, who don't have access to the internet, don't have access to technology, and the, and, the, and the group found a way of using the telephone line both to give voice to them, but also to give that voice back to them and at the same time connect them uh, to the world and to create uh, a work, I think, of positive social change. And again, I'll make the link. Participating means that we're also learning and changing our ways of seeing because we're learning modes of collaborative integration in, in various kinds of ways. Um, so I keep coming back to this, this thing which I, to me struck me perhaps more than ever with great force over these last few days. Time is obviously something that's distinct in an interactive work from a linear doc. Linear doc is, 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 is it's, it's a train, you know, you get on at the station and you don't get off till the end. It it's, it's runs its course within whatever that set time is. And time is malleable in the interactive world. It can be instant, but it can be infinite, in, in the sense that a project need not necessarily be defined by a fixed time, whether two minutes or 40 minutes. And the more interactive and participatory, the more organic it becomes and the more open-ended. And it can become truly a never-ending tale, the story one wants to keep adding to, to keep hearing, to keep watching it unfold. And again, this kind of storytelling entails a shift as well in our modes of understanding story, both as storytellers and story listeners. Uh, global, a linear doc may set out deliberately to be international and shoot in many countries around the world. It can never match interactive for its ability to capture the global pulse. Interactive can open itself to anyone, anytime, anywhere. I mean, that was the ambition of Shadows, the dream projects. In the pitch sessions, projects like Adrift wants to create an ongoing relationship between the central character who plans to set himself adrift on an iceberg for a period of the year and be connected to the world through a satellite internet link. Um, uh, Share Your Grandma was another one that wants to have everyone tell their stories about their grandma, and particularly their grandmother's recipes. Um, in fact, many of the projects, whether explicitly or in some latent fashion, want that ongoing relationship, participatory relationship with the world. And, and this will begin to continue to define the work in ways, again, I, we can't set the limits now. We can't say this is what it is. We can't. It's open-ended. It's exploratory. And it will kind of emerge in, I think, startling and different and interesting kind of ways. Another thing that I found kind of uh, uh, interesting in terms of the interactive is the, the multi-dimensional organization of information. The, the possibility in using the audience's choice-making possibilities to open different ways of creating a, uh, an experience. And I'll just give you an example. Uh, I found it quite a brilliant example in, in Le Grand Incendie. Uh, this is a... a, a, a the story, it's a shocking story, is the fact that in France, every 15 days, someone self-immolates in a public place. Now, a conventional doc could have done a great job telling this story, and we would have been, you know, horrified. We would have demanded some kind of action or, or whatever. And it would have told the story, say, of a victim on the one hand, and the family, 
uh, and say the public voice, the official voice, the, the official version of trying to explain away whatever that incident might have been. But in Le Grand Incendie, the creator Samuel Bolandar used a seemingly simple, but it's actually very sophisticated, simple but emotionally disturbing technique where the official version and the personal intimate family victim story are present, represented on screen by two graphic lines, squiggly lines. It sort of looks like a cardiogram uh, output. And the top one is the official version, bottom one is the, the and, and just by moving your cursor between the two, you kind of interlace those two stories, not by what an editor has decided, but what, what you're deciding. And it's eerie in terms of its impact, and it's profound, and it shakes you up in, in, in a way that I don't think that you would get in the classic documentary form of cutting from, you know, here's the statement from, uh, we hear the voice of the, say, the victim, and then we cut to the official version saying, well, you know, it's a terrible thing this happened. This is a whole other experience, and I think interactive will lend itself to more kinds of ways, and this is just one small example of that kind of uh, multi-dimensionality that interactive will allow uh, to explore. I think the possibilities are manifold. We've hardly begun to, to touch that. Obviously, technology um, evolves and will have an impact in terms of where the future of interactive is going. Uh, just a side word, I mean, it's one of the words that when I was pushing uh, making a lot of the transformations at the film board in terms of digital and, and, and working in very much from this view of, of art form. Uh, I had a lot of resistance, particularly from dark community, and, and the thing that was constantly thrown in my face is, oh, it's just technology. And, and at which point I would ask them, what's that camera? I, I thought that was technology as well, but you know, it's the technology that, we, that becomes transparent is no longer technology. It becomes part of who we are in that kind of way. So, the, but the truth is though, in, in this world, I mean, even in the cinematic world, obviously technology is involved in terms of the whole ways we capture images. We've gone from film base, we've gone to 4K, 8K, and so on and so forth. But it's all within a defined universe. The technology that's coming that will affect interactivity will come from many different kinds of universes um, and it's constantly evolving and will, I think, open doors for creative possibilities. I, I find, for example, that uh, the way we interact now, these interfaces, this keyboard or a trackpad or even a touchscreen, uh, very primitive and I, I find it hinders uh, as much as it, it allows us to open up into other worlds, and I think that's going to change. And I'm, I'm really uh, looking forward to days when we are creating and interacting in more natural and human ways, such as gesturally, you know, like me using my hands here. Uh, and, and I think we're already seeing that starting to happen in various ways. I mean, you know, we heard about projects... Uh, uh, wanting to work with the Oculus Rift to give that 360 degree view of the world. Um, uh, wearable technology will add to possibilities such as data capture for shaping into new reflections about our world. Um, w one thing that emerged that is not specific to interactive, but that takes on a distinctive value because of the participatory nature of interactive, which is at the heart and soul of many of these projects, and, and I was somewhat surprised by this, is the number of times that people brought up the fact that what they're doing was serving a public mandate. And my impression was, and it was very heartening, is that there's a regenerated and innovative thinking of what public mandate and what the public sphere can mean that is coming from outside those official public institutions, which are supposedly the ones that are to talk about these things, and yet in many countries, certainly in Canada and elsewhere, feel themselves besieged and have as a result often pulled in their horns, have retracted from being full-on committed to what that public remit should be. Emily uh, Linhart of Tribeca specifically spoke of their work as public service, and the projects lived up to that intention. The nanny van which travels the states physically and virtually to give help to an underclass that is often abused and taken advantage of. 
portraits from changing Rwanda wants to provoke different reflections on our responsibilities to others. Génération Quoi wants to change what society, the way society connects with and thinks about their young. Action Switchboard is all about concrete, positive social change. And this, kept, this theme of public service, public mandate, kept cropping up again and again. And it was, frankly, one of the most exciting things I heard, for I've been concerned for some time about rethinking the public sphere and wondering where that new thinking, innovative energy was going to come from because I did not see it coming from the institutions. And suddenly, here's a spark of hope about all of that. And, and, and I think the specificity and why it comes from there, I think it relates very much to the collaborative, participatory, interactive uh, thrust of, of the medium. The things I haven't mentioned, I'm going to be wrapping up shortly, such as gaming, which is being experimented with in various ways. We talked about Fort McMoney, which is a really in interesting experiment in terms of uh, uh, marrying documentary and the gaming format. Anna Maria Talash is trying to expand the reach of science documentary and link it to social transformation, again, with that public remit as a private uh, sector company with, with her project, The Hive. I personally am not sure yet if there will ever be a true conversion of game worlds and doc fiction worlds in the way people have talked. That, that's open, another kind of big question open-ended for me. I also haven't talked about financing and economic models. That didn't come up so much. But, but, but that's a whole other discussion. It's a whole other sense. And it's not simply of give me the economic model. How am I going to finance this? Because I think it relates to where audiences are going, it relates to a shifting perception of the world. I do want to mention some concerns as well, because it's not all rosy. It's not all about how wonderful this, this world is. And, I, and, and one in particular, which to me is the dark heart of the digital world, and it has to do with privacy and surveillance. And all the presentations that were made, only one, the Shadows Project, actually made reference to privacy issues. Uh, so at the moment, I, 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 I'm, I, I'm so struck by this enormous disconnect between all the searching and experimentation that is going on ahead in terms of this interactive world, where we're demanding a lot of information, personal information, private information, a lot from our audiences. And so we've got all this kind of gung-ho-ness in terms of really excited and for very good reason about this. And on the other hand, we have the massively disturbing ongoing story that was unveiled by Edward Snowden um, about the massive world of, of kind of uh, the, 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 these spy agencies grabbing hold of all of our information, and God knows what they're doing with it. So, and I don't think we can separate that world of massive spying and how I think it distorts the public sphere. I think it distorts private lives, and I can't separate that from what we're trying to do in the interactive world, uh, which I think has an almost naive trust in collaboration and participation. And that de facto, that naive trust, puts everything at risk of being scooped up uh, in the maws of the so-called security agencies. And I have no solutions to propose, although I suspect if we put it out there for a collaborative crowdsourced solution, we might find one. And, and finally, I want to conclude by going back to the notion of the epistemological shift, that shift of how we grasp the world. And I, I was thinking, um, as Anne Derry uh, from the New York Times was talking about multimedia at the newspaper, and that was the specific term she used, not interactive, not transmedia, it was multimedia. And it, it just led me to a train of thought that multimedia as such isn't new. It had other forms in the past, and I think one of the most powerful, in fact, in terms of multimedia experiences, uh, was the medieval church. It was in and of itself an immersive multimedia experience. Now, we may look at a Giotto fresco, for example, in a chapel and see art. For the medieval audience, they saw a story whose narration would have been provided by the priest in his sermon, the soundtrack by the choir, with a sensorium provided by the incense, and the interactivity by taking communion. The very architecture of the church, you know, those Gothic spires, the soaring spaces within them, would have framed the story in a particular way. And, and 
And this particular kind of mode of multimedia experience, of narrative, had a very profound effect on its audiences because it was set in a defined conceptual universe that was defined by the passion of Christ. We, we don't have a shared, coherent, and cohesive conceptual universe that we share among ourselves, let alone among the different nations of the world. Yet, and even though it has been argued that the digital world does as much to divide by tribalizing, so you go to the things that you're familiar with and that you know, as it does to connect, my, my own feeling is that we're actually in a slow movement to something else. I think that there is inherent in living with the technologies in the ways we do and in the ways that it is evolving that will continue to, to kind of push the shift of the ways that we know what it is to know. And we're blundering through this uh, transformation. We're doing it in fits and starts. We're taking steps back. We are dividing up and trying. But I think there's underlying that there's a kind of forward movement. And I think it's leading us to some kind of what I call a kind of inverse Jungianism. You know, Jung talked about a collective unconscious. And I think where this is leading us to is a collective consciousness. And for that very reason, the interactive work is becoming the artwork of our age. It's the one more than any other that will define the conscious of humanity through a seeing that is a seeing through the eyes of all. And I think it's the art form we need as we drive forward relentlessly to the great issues that threaten us in the coming decades. Thank you. Was I'd say there were there was those there were those that said yes this is exciting we understand we need to explore without worrying now for the moment about economic models and then there were those that said um, this is all great you seem to have fun uh, doing all this but why do you do it. Why do you do it? Because there's no money to be made and there's no money available or not enough money to make a serious business out of it. So I have this feeling that we're in, like you said, we're in a changing mode where it's not yet uh, viable on the standards, on the economic standards that the audiovisual production world has. Um, what do you think? What, would, what advice would you give to... Uh, to a, a, a producer who would be interested but yet does not see how to get involved because there's not enough money to spend your time doing it. I, I don't think I have advice to give anyone. About no, but, uh, you, but, but look, I, I'll tell you, look, the fact is it's happening. The fact is there, there, there are funds available in different jurisdictions. I think uh, many of the projects we saw here, because you know, broadcasters have woken up to the fact that this is a game they've got to get. So a lot of them, you know, Nouvelle Écriture en France Television, Arte has been a strong supporter of, uh, of, of this form of creation here in France. In Canada, there's uh, funding, uh, as uh, you know, Nathalie Clermont spoke about at the opening session in terms of that. So, so there are ways of, of kind of piecing together the funding, uh, of Frank. but frankly, you, you, you know what, what is gonna happen, regardless of the fact that people look at this world and they see the possibilities of creating and I think people have an instinctive feeling for creating and they're going to create regardless of whether I, you know, give them permission or any broadcaster says, I'm the gatekeeper, I'll give you permission, they're going to do it. They've done it on YouTube, they've created their own channels, they've made new forms, you know, created new kinds of stars. It will keep happening whether uh, we want it to or not. And it may be that it'll put pressure in terms of, uh, uh, you know, what's at risk here is, is, is our, our structures, which we think immutable. We're so used to our financing structures that have been certainly in Canada, France, elsewhere, put in place over many number of years to support a very defined vision of the audiovisual universe. That's shifting. I'm not sure that these structures have caught up with that yet. No, we're, like you said, not only are we in transition, but we're in transition because the trend towards more crowdsourced uh, content is, goes far beyond 
uh, the audiovisual. Uh, it's, uh, it's a phenomenon that affects us all, like through social networking, the relationship, I guess, we have with stories um, has changed because the interface has changed. And because the interface changes, the, uh, the, the, the way, the place that stories have in our lives are changing. And what strikes me and what has struck me during those few days at the Sunny Lab and the presentations was very much how everything can be material for a story that we know in the factual world of the audiovisual, but it's also how much a story can be told to all and just to one. Uh, which is something that Alexandre Brachet uh, stressed very much, and I think he's absolutely right with this. So my, my question was not just economic, and, and yeah, we don't have any advice to give, but this in sharing opinion is how do we accelerate, how do we accelerate our knowledge, our experience in those new ways of telling stories, of exploring new interfaces, when we know that the motivation cannot be an economical one. The younger people who are coming into the field who have not experienced the traditional ways of producing, um, uh, the, all the, the, the producers that are, that are here and who have been trained like ourselves in a certain way, a traditional way of producing and telling stories, uh, how, do we, how do we accelerate our, tra our um, uh, new knowledge of connecting with audiences, and you stressed a lot that point. Audiences are central. Yeah, the, the audiences are there, and I, I think in terms of the uh, acceleration, well, well, first of all, there are economic models, and there are going to be a range of things. I, I focus more in terms of uh, art form, but that's not the only thing that's going to happen there. That, I, I mean, even for documentary filmmakers, uh, they're often, what they're doing is, for example, well, they'll do that kind of feature doc, but to keep the companies going, they're going to do uh, divertissement, they're going to do reality television, and they're going to do all sorts. Uh, Lily from uh, China spoke about that. They're enormously successful with online interactive uh, equivalent of reality shows uh, that are very successful financially. So, so, so we don't have to kind of limit the scope of thinking. And all of that also teaches learn. We, we learn how to do things differently through all that. Any question? Yes. Bonjour, merci beaucoup pour cette masterclass. Alors, une question plutôt technique. Euh, moi, je fais partie de la génération euh, qui a pris le cinéma. Euh, il y a le champ contre champ, il y a hors champ. Alors, dans le interactive, il n'y a plus le champ contre champ ni le hors champ. Est-ce qu'il y a un moment, euh, vous, plutôt moi comme vous, euh, est-ce qu'il y a un moment où vous avez hésité de traverser cette frontière, à franchir ces, ces, ces barrières de, de langage cinématographique dont vous avez cité dans le film euh, qu'il y a une narration, l'ancienne narration est-ce qu'à un moment que, il vous paraît difficile d'affranchir ces, 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 ces frontières il n'y a plus de champ contre champ il n'y a plus le hors champ il y a, mais, est, tout est interactif mais, mais je vais essayer à Michel, Tom, Michel de répondre et peut-être vous demander de traduire les questions parce que beaucoup de gens ne vont pas prendre les headsets ou juste résumer la question en anglais ça serait utile je pense que la question est How did we, how did we um, uh, decide to make that tra uh, transfer to an idiom, to a language where there is no longer the traditional values of the language of cinema? Um, and how do, do we feel uh, that we can give that up? It's because everything becoming interactive breaks the rules of the traditional language of cinema. Would you say that's your question? And I'll leave Michel because before he did that particular leap, he was Mr. Cinema in France. I was. I, I used to work for Arte, where I was a film commissioner for commissioner for ten years. And in the process of doing my work there, reading scripts and watching films and making decisions on the films Arte would get involved with, I started seeing the the birth of uh, this new way of telling stories, including the audience, and making the storytelling process no longer an object, the film, 
that we were trying to do, but a process within which the conversation was starting to become more equal with the audience than just a monologue. And um, I saw the potential that it had to transform the storytelling moment from the, uh, the moment of a consumption, where you're consuming, you are uh, listening uh, to something which is round, finished, an object, to an experience. And this notion of transforming the moment of the story into an experience is key in the way we, re we want to relate to the world. Uh, and I think what interactive content brings is this possibility to take the next step after we have learned the language of telling story through images. That language has become a universal language. Whether we are in China, in Europe, in South America, we watch a film, we totally understand the language. We understand flashbacks, flash forwards, we, we understand all of this. So we have this within us. Now we can use this language to go one step further and sharing it in different ways because I don't quite agree with you that in doing interactive content we have to give up the language of cinema. But where you are absolutely right, we have to consider that it's part of us now. So. Um, I would say it's just, the, it's just the next step, like when you learn a language, if you start learning German, you will go through the steps of learning the vocabulary and the grammar, and you will not be able to hold the philosophical conversation for another maybe two or three years until you truly master the language. So I think in everything you've been saying, actually, we are in the very first step where we are learning the vocabulary and the grammar. So. Um, Maybe, yes, I think Christian is, is starting to be upset because we're going No, I'm not, being, I'm not being upset at all. But it's just, I just wanted to conclude that in everything we've done and in listening to Tom's speech, it, this that we're talking about in Interactive is not about giving up the language of cinema, the form of cinema, nor the traditional formats of cinema like you have so well said. It's a question of opening up to new possibilities and using our knowledge of the language of cinema to transform it and hold, uh, you know, new meta-conversations with that. Okay. Um, thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Tom. Uh, thank you. Can we have a round of applause for